going to be very much talking about the skeletons aspect of the uh, session title, in contrast to Howard and his stories. Um, so forgive me if there's too much osteology for you. I'm also drawing on the themes of the conference, which is visualisation. So I'm going to be talking to you about a small case study, which is part of my PhD. It's also a work in progress, so the interpretation may change, it's not yet finalised, and I'm very much looking forward to any comments or insights you may have. Um, so I'm researching the taphonomic alteration of human remains in Neolithic Malta, particularly late Neolithic Malta, um, and I'm working on the Shara Circle Hypogeum, which is located on Gozo. So we know that there's a general lack of cortical surface modifications at the site, and this indicates that there are very specific interactions with the remains. And so the taphonomic insights really come from using archaeothanatological methods and looking at post-depositional alterations of the remains. This is very difficult to do in the lab with only dry bones. So I'm going to be, I have been, trying to align the digitisation of the site in ArcGIS with my data that I collect in the lab. So there's been a lot of work implementing digital methods in osteology lately. Um, for example, Wilhelmsen and Del Unto have employed photogrammetry to create a detailed 3D model of the site at Sandby in Holland. Um, and they've viewed fractures across both skeletons in situ using this methodology. And they've interpreted this bilateral symmetry of fractures, um, you can sort of see it in the top here, as indicating that the roof of the house structure that they were buried in collapsed on them after death. Um, this interpretation has been aided by a recent modern excavation of the site and the implementation of a digital re recording methodology on site. Um, now, I really wanted to see how useful GIS could be when we apply it to a site that was excavated in the past, in my case, over 20 years ago, and without a comprehensive photographic record, because on Malta the sun was so bright that they couldn't photograph the deposits very well. Um, and... Also, the site I'm working on is so heavily commingled that we couldn't get, I don't think it would have been possible to get a good detailed record of all of the spits building up over time photographically. So the aim of this paper is really twofold, um, both method methodological and theoretical. Whilst new techniques allow us to record human remains in ever-increasing detail, can the digitisation of archival site records supplement and enhance lab-based analysis? So I'm quickly going to whiz you through where we are geographically, so you get a sort of sense of this. Um, Malta is a tiny, tiny island about 80 kilometres off the south coast of Sicily. Uh, it's only 246 kilometres squared, and it's kind of a theme in prehistory that weird things happen on islands. <laughs> they create a really unique situation and location for the proliferation of certain cultures for a long period of time in some cases, and you may be more example with Neolithic Orkney. Um, the site I'm working on is located on the smaller sister island of Gozo, so maybe even weirder things are happening there. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, we have two hypogea, one on Malta and one on Gozo, that we know of, and these are perhaps lesser known than the above-ground megalithic monuments on Malta, these really large ritual temple complexes. Um, and as I said, it was excavated over 20 years ago. So it encompasses a really large cave system that was excavated by hand and enclosed by a megalithic circle within the West Cave and the East Cave and a pit on the threshold and also an earlier rock cut tomb, which is not depicted, but was located on the southeast corner. We have over 220,000 fragments of human bone from over 300 contacts, so perhaps you can see how this provides me with some methodological difficulties for sampling it taphonomically. Um, and we have also a, a large error of potential MNI, and this depends upon the temporal chronological grouping of context, but we have at least 450 individuals. However, very few of them are complete and articulated in situ. It's a heavily disarticulated and commingled deposit. Um, we're currently, as part of the Fragsis ERC project, working on reanalyzing the human remains and refining the chronology. So at the moment, we know that the main phase of burial activity occurred at the very end of the late Neolithic. Um, we say Neolithic because there's not as yet any introduction of metals to Malta, 
but where it fits into this typical chronological phasing is difficult to know for sure. Okay. So, I'm going to be talking you through a particular deposit on the West Cave sy system, at uh, the very <coughs> west of the site, Context 783, um, which is all of the digitised bone that you can see on the right-hand side there. Um, we fully digitised all of the excavation plans now um, into ArcGIS and recorded the levels of each bit to allow their 3D visualisation in ArcScene. Um, but I'm going to be drawing on just the ArcGIS digitisation for you today, the 2D digitisation. So the resulting deposit in the display zone does show some trends. You might be able to see that there seems to have been a clearance of a corridor between the megaliths at the southwest corner and the um, entrance into the rest of the site to the east here. We also have some more complete individuals at the edge of the deposit. There's an individual we might be able to see here in the north, um, and there's one down here. Uh, those, are what, those are the ones that I can pick up now, but we have at least five. They occur at varying um, stages in the stratigraphy, um, but for the most part, the ones that have been talked about up until now seem to be adults. Um, 783 is also quite unique in the context of the rest of the site because it contains a really high percentage of pathologies, particularly extreme pathologies, uh, dental disease, but also um, pathologies which particularly seem to have affected the extremities, the hands and feet, and the spine. So I'm going to be focusing on even greater depth here to only one metre square in the northeastern corner here because it was recorded really well at the time it was excavated. It was recorded and excavated by one individual all the way to the, ba to the base of the deposit just above the limestone bedrock. Um, bone numbers were indicated on the excavation plan and also on the find bags, which has allowed me, in theory, to cross-reference the information recorded in the lab where I have recorded all of the find bag labels into my database alongside the taponomic information, with that recorded at excavation um, and uh, with the information recorded in ArcGIS where the, each polygon, each bone here has an entry in the attributes table uh, recording details described at excavation. So this is kind of a, um, an experiment of whether what we see in the lab corresponds to what we see in the ground. Um, Okay, so taking you through to my one metre square, 97112, it comprises four spits with a total of 3,611 fragments, and over 80% of the deposit is non adult in age. There is one articulated semi complete inhumation at the base. Um, taphonomically, uh, we can see that actually there's fairly good preservation. Um, there's good cortical surface preservation with not much evidence of weathering or abrasion, um, so the remains don't seem to have been exposed. <coughs> for a very long period of time, if much at all. Um, there's also no gnawing or cut marks, um, so the site seems to have been protected from intervention by fauna and scavenging. Um, so fracture analysis showed that long bone breakages were all post-depositional or modern, and therefore intervention with the dead bodies and redistribution occurred post-decomposition. So this is important taphonomically in terms of there's no intervention with the fleshed body that we can see. So, my results allowed me to quantify the remains. Um, in terms of an uh, the percentage of elements, so here I've inventoried the number of fragments identified for each region of the body and represented them as a percentage of the total deposit. And you can see that crania, uh, thoracic vertebrae and ribs really dominate the deposit. So there's an emphasis on the upper body, and particularly on the thorax. But a different pattern emerges when we correct this for MNI. Um, so, the um, number of individuals that I have estimated for this square is six adults and 13 non-adults, but this is on the basis of both loose and in situ teeth, and by that I mean in occlusion in the mandible or the maxilla. However, for, the, for adults at least, the postcranial skeleton mostly represents only two, so we can see that there has been quite a lot of rearrangement and redistribution in this area. Um, and what emerges here is that the pelvis is the best represented element and we have a lot of complete child ilia um, and there is perhaps some size or bone density bias here because we have a real lack of hyoids and coccygees and carpals 
Um, but this could also be a result of taphonomic factors and the high level of uh, rearrangement. So what became evident in the lab is that we have a few bone pairs in articulations. Um, and there are some regions of the skeleton or some long bones that articulate with others. Um, and this suggested that the practices of disarticulation were more complex than originally thought, that some long bones were either left preferentially in articulation in situ, or that they were carefully deposited together and kept together as part of secondary deposition. So whether more articulating regions were actually visible during excavation was something that I thought I could use the GIS to help me analyse. So when attempting to link bone numbers between my database and the digitisation, however, I realised that it was not always going to be possible or reliable. <laughs> so the um, lower arm and hand that I just showed you on the previous slide, um, I did manage to locate. So you can see here that they are against the megalith and they don't seem to be associated with any other remains. However, a femur for which oh, I only have one entry in my database seemed to correspond to a pair of femora. However, I did not see this pair of femora. So there's either some discrepancy between uh, the excavation plan or the fine bags. There's something going wrong somewhere. However, I was able to locate quite a good number of bone numbers. Um, and where I wasn't, I could at least identify regions of bones, particularly crania, long bones, vertebrae, ribs, or hands and feet. And so uh, just a brief analysis just showed that there was some clear clustering here. So we've got 12 crania deposited mostly centrally against this megalith um, in just this one small metre square, and most of them are non-adult as well. Um, most of them occur in an upper spit and then some in a lower spit, so they're stacking them over time, but we can't refine this very well chronologically due to um, the obvious evidence that they have been disarticulated from the rest of the skeleton postcranial remains and moved after death, but we don't know how long after death. Um, so it obviously begs the question of whether the memory of these cranial deposits was retained or whether um, hundreds of years had gone by and they had come back and deposited them in the same place. I mean, I would contend um, and suggest that they did remember that this was an area where cranial were deposited. Um, long bones covered a wider distribution in this square, um, but some of them seem to follow a kind of southwest to northeast axis, and I don't know if that has any significance yet. Okay. So, taking you on to articulations in situ. I carefully searched through the deposit for regions and articulating bone pairs, um, and it became apparent that there were two common patterns. The tibia and fibula and the ulnar and radius often seem to be an articulation, and large portions of the axial skeleton, including ribs, also seem to be. Um, so rearrangement has often focused on um, what Dude would term persistent joints, so areas of the skeleton with um, really tough ligaments. And so this suggests that they have allowed bodies to fully decompose before they have redistributed the remains because we don't have any evidence of cut marks. Um, so interestingly, the... Uh, okay. Oh, so in addition, we also have two complete areas. So we've got a hand here and a hand here and a lower leg and a foot here um, that you can see in situ here. So I think, I believe that these articulating vertebrae and ribs and the devil, you know, thoraxes, um, represent primary inhumation of individuals in this square um, due to the fact that the ribs are still in articulation with the vertebrae. Um, where, however, the rest of the skeleton, the appendicular skeleton, has been redistributed elsewhere. And what's interesting is that two of these individuals in upper spits correspond to the alignment of the complete, almost complete individual in the lower spit. Um, and it's possible that they were just deposited in this manner because the megalith was almost then used as a kind of supporting kind of back wall for the burial, and this just was an obvious place to deposit them. Um, however, this individual here, uh, orientated on a north, sort of north to south axis, shows that it wasn't a, a prescribed practice. So perhaps, again, they're citing earlier depositional practices in this area. Um, and from this measurements from this ilium, 
uh, suggested that this individual was also a similar age, an old child, to the individual at the base in Spit 3. What I did, wasn't able to get a sense of, however, from the GIS was of the, the, the building up of the deposit over time. And whilst the GIS allows you, because of the recording of Spits, to import the features into ArcScene and extrude each polygon um, and view it in 3D space, there's still kind of privileges and prioritizes the end stage of the deposit, the complete deposit, and also doesn't give you a very clear picture of um, the commingling, the density of the remains in this area. So I just created a GIF of the deposit building up from each bit and going back down again to see if this helped to draw out any patterns. Um, but what's important to remember is that, once again, this is the, the, the end of the interaction with the remains and that this has to help inform us about practices which have... <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> this has to help inform us about um, the engagement with the remains and their movement uh, beforehand. Okay, um, So we can see that there are varied treatments of the dead here, multiple modes of deposition. We've got primary inhumation, secondary deposition, and cranial stacking in clear phases. So age representation, uh, you can see here that we have a complete range of ages, um, and that these categories are not helpful. They're actually constraining these osteological categories. A lot of individuals overlap categories. Um, so you can see that we have a lot of young children and old children, but that's also because they cross over a really wide age range. Um, um, and taphonomic factors don't seem to have biased too much against the preservation of fetal or infant bones, except in the case of post depositional crushing from the overlying weight of uh, overlying deposits. Um, the lack of evidence for scavenging, scavenging and exposure shows a careful treatment of the remains of the dead and hasn't impacted negatively against their preservation. Now, broadly speaking, there are some differences in the treatment of remains within these age categories. So uh, the remains of young children were more disturbed, with perhaps only bone pairs in articulation, Whereas for the old child remains that I was able to locate, there seem to be larger regions of the skeleton present, but whether this reflects actual practices in the past is more difficult to tell. So material correlates for age, so often used to determine defining periods in an individual's life or society's concept of time, are more impossible to identify at this site. We don't have typical grave goods. There's only one small find in this area, a church scraper located behind the individual in spit three at the base, and nearby sheds of the bowl were also deposited. And it's been suggested that it was a common practice to deposit an offering bowl with inhumations at the site. And whilst the example from this square seemed to have been larger, it could indicate that this individual, possibly aged around 10 to 12 years of, uh, of age at the time of death, was regarded as an adult and therefore in death treated in an appropriate manner. So the 2009 analysis of the human remains found that many pre-adults were located on the edges of spatially distinct areas, particularly in the West Cave system. And this has been interpreted as the performance of burial rites which reflected social conception of the life cycle. Pre-adults are often conceived of as marginal alongside other categories of difference, such as disabled individuals. And this is then physically reflected in the choice of their burial location. The liminality of younger individuals could have been performed in a very specific, culturally prescribed manner, with the treatment of bodies of dead babies and children following the same pattern and cycle of a long process of articulation to disarticulation as most adult bodies, but the location of their deposition then marking out their age and therefore their difference. In this context more generally, however, other deposits at the edge of the feature are not composed of such high numbers of pre-adults, and therefore this seems to undermine this interpretation. Less attention has been paid to a more detailed contextual study of the younger individuals, and the preservation of an almost complete articulated inhumation at the very base of this deposit, in a manner similar to other adult inhumations at the site, could reveal some insights into the social conception of maturation and personhood in Neolithic Malta. The treatment of this individual in death, closely mir mirroring that of other adults, suggests that they were also viewed as an adult in life, and therefore also behaved like one, participating in the social and economic networks of the community, perhaps performing chores related to agriculture, crafts, or childcare. It's possible that chronological age, marked by calendrical events of the year passing, for example, may not have been recognised in prehistoric Malta. So much as biological age, perhaps the eruption of permanent teeth signified um, progression into a later age stage. 
or the acquisition of skills and the successful completion of tasks which aided the wider community. The biological, bioarchaeological evidence for the lived experience of childhood comes mainly from the dentition and crania. They indicate periods of nutritional stress and growth disruptions. And we also see um, many teeth displaying anti-mortem chipping. Now, this could have been related to occupation, or it could also have been a cultural act to mark out specific identities that may have related to lineage or age or sex. So in conclusion, I tried to respond to some of the recent calls for smaller scale contextual analyses of skeletal remains um, and assess the osteological and taphonomic evidence through a range of other lenses, digital, contextual and theoretical. And the results of my attempts to link field records in two forms, both the excavation plans and the find bag labels, um, shows that the level of detail which is possible in resulting interpretations is heavily dependent upon di the diligence of on-site recorders. It's probably not going to be possible to replicate this study across much of the rest of the site because it wasn't common for individual bone numbers to be allocated during excavation simply due to the sheer number of bones encountered. Um, but at other sites where this is also the case, photographic records could possibly make up for this. Um, and there's definitely potential for the implementation of GIS to visualise and analyse skeletal remains from sites which were activated before the introduction of digital recording methods. And where a good level of recording exists, the visualisation adds layers of information which are unattainable and are crucial to the aims of archaeothanatology. These data can help us to interpret depositional acts and place the skeletal remains in context with other archaeological features. So I hope I've shown you some of the potential here for this method through the examination and configuration of personhood and age in prehistoric Thank you.